This is a lecture for Bio 5, Week 7. We'll be continuing our theme of the cardiovascular system, specifically by talking about some cell types that make an appearance in the blood, uh, this time in the context of the immune system. So we'll start out this first lecture by talking about what actually causes disease in humans, um, kind of split it up in terms of biodiversity, and then in the second part of the lecture, which will be posted separately, still within the same week's module though, I'll talk about the immune system. Before we get into that, though, I wanted to go over a couple of important announcements um, and talk about the reflection that was just posted. I will review it individually and give you guys feedback, but I wanted to kind of address a lot of things in one fell swoop. So the first thing we're going to be doing is changing the lecture schedule just very slightly. Um, so hopefully you guys are looking at the schedule, looking at the syllabus, kind of aware of course policies. Um, one thing I wanted to point out was that last week there was not any new material. Instead, you had an extra week to complete the quiz and the reflection, um, and then that time was for you to study for the exam. So I know that some of you thought that might have meant uh, that uh, I was going to host a structured review. Um, lab and lecture are pretty separate, even though the material should support one another. Uh, so when I meant review for lab practical, I meant you should review in that free time and use that time to study. Um, but I'm always here if you want to email me with questions. Uh, you can email your lab instructor. Um, so that time was extra time for you to study for the lab practical. You're going to have another week like that at the second lab practical. So again, if you have specific questions, please email me, but I uh, won't be posting a separate review for that. I will, however, be kind of structuring review into the lectures up until that time. Um, so today, uh, some of this material that we're going to be talking about was already covered in lab, specifically in ter terms of blood smears. Some of it is going to be covered next week. Um, so Material in biology tends to build on itself. It's not in crisp little packets. Uh, it doesn't get separated out week by week. You should be kind of building on those ideas, tying in that stuff together that you've already learned about. Otherwise, things are just impossible to learn. You can't learn everything as a completely new subject. You have to grow organically. You have to keep building on yourself. So when I kind of tie in ideas from previous weeks, it's not to trick you, it's to make sure that you're thinking about everything that you've learned and tying it together. Um, and then the last thing is that uh, to do with the schedule is that we're switching weeks eight and nine in terms of the lecture. Um, lab is going to remain consistent, but I'm gonna cover the digestive and endocrine systems next week, uh, and then I'll cover the nervous system the following week. So those are gonna get switched. Okay, so for the Canvas reflection, um, I gave you guys seven statements about the cardiovascular system. Uh, you were supposed to determine whether you thought they were true or false, and then just pick three of them to explain your answer based on the readings, uh, the lecture material, and your previous knowledge. So it turns out that all of these statements are false. They all represent common misconceptions about the cardiovascular system and respiration that people tend to have. So I wanted to point out where you could find the answers to all of these. And I'm just gonna go over a few of them because I saw some common themes. So uh, these are the slides that you can refer to to kind of get some more information for uh, the ones that you picked. You're not gonna be tested on these. I'm not gonna ask them to you as true false questions on a quiz, um, unless I explicitly state it in the study guide, but even then, probably not. They really are just to get you thinking critically. Um, so some of these are listed just as slides, but for statements three, four, and seven, I wanted to review those. So statement three was about heart attacks. Um, and if you read the statement thoroughly, it says something about arteries close or vessels close to the heart uh, that supply the body with, um, with blood. So that was the tricky part of it, is that yes, when the coronary arteries, which are by definition close to the heart because they supply the heart with blood, get clogged and the heart muscle itself is deprived of oxygen, that can lead to a myocardial infarction or heart attack. Um, but it's not just caused by any old clog that's close to the heart. So uh, especially not ones where there are systemic arteries. So make sure you're reading that question carefully. Um, and then the next one uh, was 
the statement was arteries are found uh, near your heart and veins are found farther away from your heart or maybe vice versa. Um, veins and arteries are found everywhere throughout your body and both of them connect to your heart. Um, both of them are found in the farthest reaches of your body. Um, so it's the main difference between those is the direction in which blood flows. Arteries move blood in the direction away from the heart veins return blood back to the heart, um, but that flow and that transition between them is happening throughout the whole body. Um, but another major difference between them is they're structurally quite different because they have different functions. And then the last question had to do with uh, respiration and kind of this idea of cell respiration versus um, kind of macro level system respiration. Um, and I think I mentioned this in the lecture, but uh, when we have cellular respiration happening in our cells, we have oxygen being used and we have CO2, carbon dioxide, being produced as a waste product. And that whole process is a series of kind of carbohydrate metabolism to generate ATP, which is the energy for our cells. So that's happening in every cell in our body uh, that has mitochondria. Um, and kind of in certain situations, you don't even need mitochondria if you're just going through glycolysis. Um, it gets really tricky. But anyway, most cells in your body need this source of energy. Most of them are using oxygen and giving off CO2. So that is called cell respiration. Oxygen is entering into our body through our respiratory system and CO2 is being given off. So the exchange with our atmosphere and kind of with blood and body tissues is happening on a macro level in our respiratory system, but it's also happening in a micro level in pretty much every cell in our body. So all of this exchange is kind of taking place in a very fluid way, um, and it's certainly not the case that ATP is generated in your lungs and then spread throughout your body. The kind of components that are used to make ATP enter through your lungs and spread through your body, but the actual process of making ATP happens in your cells. So I hope that makes sense. Um, I just wanted to focus on those three because it seemed like there was kind of a lot of confusion about those specifically. Okay, so that's enough review from last week. Um, I, today we're going to get again into the immune system and defense, kind of in the reverse order. We'll talk first about what causes disease in humans and then how do we fight that disease. So these chapters fit together because chapters 21 through 24 are about pathogens. Um, viruses, bacteria, and archaea, protists, and fungi all live their own lives. They can all live these um, lives that are quite separate from humans, uh, but a lot of them do cause disease. So these are pathogens, things that cause disease, with the exception of archaea. Chapter 42 is about the immune system, so that is the system in our body that's specifically designed to fight against pathogens. Um, so one thing that you'll note is that sometimes when we talk about systems, there is a lot of overlap between them. There's stuff that can maybe fit into one system and also in another system. So for example, we're going to talk about white blood cells. Some of those are made in bone marrow. Some of them circulate through our bloodstream. Some of them fight in our immune system. So that's an example where we have these cells that are kind of tied into many different systems. Okay, so some things to kind of keep in mind from past weeks um, are those characteristics of prokaryotic and eukaryotic cells. I'll review the prokaryotes uh, when we get to bacteria. Uh, endocytosis and signaling between cells is going to be important when we talk about the immune system. Uh, characteristics of different leukocytes, which are white blood cells, um, specifically granulocytes versus agranulocytes. Uh, thrombocytes and components of the blood are going to be important to keep in mind from week five. And then circulation through blood vessels, um, expanding on that with lymph vessels a little bit is also going to be important. Okay, so we're gonna start with the smallest guys here, the viruses. Um, and so we'll go through four different sections, kind of thinking about basic structures of viruses. Uh, those are things that we can target with drugs. Their life cycle, the different steps of the life cycle are also things we can target with drugs and tie back to cell theory. Um, and then thinking about how vaccines work, how we might treat HIV. We'll do a quick case study on HIV. And then you should know what these things called prions are.
Okay, so this is a slide you saw before in week two. Um, it's kind of this general tree of life, and it's all the kingdoms, which is a big group of organisms that we consider to be living. So note that viruses are not on there because it turns out that viruses are acellular. They are non-cellular, they're not made up of cells. And the top right there is an example of the HIV virus. That's probably a common one that you're familiar with, um, and we'll talk a little bit more about it later today. Um, viruses are also not like cells and not like forms of life in that they have to hijack other cells in order to make copies of themselves. They have to hijack the cells of organisms that are made up of cells in order to reproduce, and reproduction is a key quality of life. So this is the HIV life cycle. Um, I do not expect you to know this. Um, it's just kind of for your reference. We'll kind of refer back to the general life cycle of viruses. This idea that they have to bind to living cells, integrate with them, uh, incorporate their genetic material with them, and then use their resources in order to make copies of themselves. Um, so Again, it turns out that being made up of at least one cell and reproducing our requirements for life, and since viruses don't meet either of these requirements, we do not consider them to be alive. So remember, uh, in week two, we learned about unified cell theory, which describes our understanding of life, this idea that all living things are comprised of one or more cells. Cells are the basic unit of life, and new cells arise from living cells. So cells produce other cells. So again, being made up of cells and reproduction, key qualities of life. So even though viruses are acellular, again, that means non-cellular, not made up of cells, they do have important structural components that kind of uh, store their genetic information and allow them to do what they do. Um, so let's go ahead and take a look here at this simplified image that has the nucleic acid genome, the capsid, and the envelope. So that nucleic acid might be RNA or DNA, and it can range in size quite dramatically. Uh, DNA and RNA are just a couple of different types of nucleic acids. They have a small structural difference between them. Our genetic information is encoded as the DNA, but we use RNA quite often in different forms in order to send signals, to transcribe and translate proteins. Um, so RNA is important if a bit more temporary in our body. Um, and a lot of viruses store their information just as RNA. Viruses also have capsids, which are a protein coat, um, and that consists of most of the viral mass. So the bulk of the virus is made up of this capsid. That capsid is made up of smaller pieces called capsomeres. So if you ever see the term capsomere arrangement, that's kind of the structure of the capsid. And then some viruses also have an envelope, which is made up of the cell membrane of the host, kind of from budding out. Um, and that's kind of like an invisibility cloak. It helps protect the virus from the host's immune response because the virus is hiding inside of the host cell. So viruses uh, multiply inside living cells. They can't reproduce on their own. Um, and so in order to interact with those cells, some viruses also have those little spikes that you can see here that are made up of carbohydrates and proteins that are useful for interacting with host cells. So viruses are kind of tricky to classify um, because they you know, constantly change genetically. They're all sorts of weird shapes. Um, there's not really reliable ways of relating them to one another, and they're also non-living. So a lot of the ways that we classify relatedness is based on reproduction and cells, um, which viruses don't have. So viruses are now classified based on a system um, of how they basically get to proteins, um, how a specific type of nucleic acid, messenger RNA, which is key for coding for proteins, is produced. Um, so the nucleic acid still plays a role in classifying them, even though they are constantly mutating and really tricky to pin down. We can also still kind of generally group viruses based on their shape. So these are some terms that you might come across in your future biology education. Um, helical viruses. Uh, helical is kind of tricky because when you think about helix, you might think about something kind of 
curved. Um, and here you can see that the capsomere arrangement is kind of helical. It's like a, a nice curl in your hair. Um, but when you look at the SEM image above, it looks pretty straight. So when they are curled up so tightly, it appears straight, uh, but that's still called a helical virus. Icosahedral means that they have a lot of different faces on them, kind of like a D20 if you play Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and then there's a lot of different types of complex viruses as well. So this is the uh, artist rendition of the Zika virus, which has been in the news quite a lot lately. Um, it's an enveloped virus. And then this is really cool. It's the T4 bacteriophage, which infects E. coli. Um, bacterio means that it infects bacteria. Phage is a, another way of saying virus or a particular type of virus. And these look like alien spaceships and they infect their hosts like them too. So it's kind of interesting, um, but that's another type of complex virus. So like I mentioned, those T4 bacteriophages are crazy and uh, all viruses depend on living cells to reproduce. So here you can see that T4 bacteriophage attaching to an E. coli cell um, and kind of inserting its genetic material into the cell. So even though viral life cycles might be kind of complex, there's kind of a rhythm to it. Um, and it has to do with kind of interacting with receptors or with the surface of the cell in some way. So basically what happens is they have to attach to the cell, maybe through a receptor. They have to get across that cell membrane. They have to share their genetic information with the host and kind of sneak their way into the host's genetic information. So the host processes it just like their own information. So the host thinks they're coding for their own proteins. Really, they're coding for the viruses. Um, so it's been hijacked. Um, and so they're using the host cell's machinery to make those proteins. When I say machinery, I specifically mean RNA polymerase, which is used to encode messenger RNA from DNA, and also ribosomes, which are used to put together proteins from messenger RNA. Um, so different enzymes and different organelles are useful uh, for, for uh, assembling the virus. So then it's assembled and then the virus has to leave the cell. So that's kind of the flow to it, even though it might happen at different paces and in different ways. So one other uh, tricky thing is that when the virus is entering and exiting the cell, it can cause cytopathic or cell damaging effects. Um, and that happens to different extents, uh, specifically depending on the life cycle and the type of virus. So this is kind of reiterating what I just said, um, specifically in the example of HIV, so human immunodeficiency virus, which eventually uh, can cause AIDS. And again, I'll talk about that more in just a little bit. So basically what happens with HIV is it binds to a specific type of receptor called CD4. It fuses with CD4, really kind of gets integrated with it. Um, and then it goes through reverse transcription. So it has to sneak its way into the cell's genetic material. Keep that term reverse transcription in mind because I'll get back to it in a moment. Um, once it becomes part of the cell's material, it, genetic information, it's been integrated, it then uses the cells to make more copies of HIV, so replication. It puts together those HIV particles and then uh, it buds out of the cell. So it goes through exocytosis basically to leave the cell and become infectious HIV. So when viruses go through their life cycles, it can uh, happen in a couple of different ways. Um, in the lytic cycle, lytic should make you think about lysis or cell splitting. So that's when the virus leaving the cell splits open the host cell and the host cell dies. So it can be very damaging. Um, lysogenic is different. So uh, lysogenic, I think that's kind of a longer word than lytic. So lysogenic lasts longer. The host cell remains alive. Um, it can still be used to make copies of the virus or it can just have changes made to it as a result of lysogeny. So this is kind of an example of the two different cycles, um, and actually some viruses can you know, go back and forth between the two cycles. So if we want to avoid disease transmission, there's a lot of different things we can do. We come into contact with viruses all the time, um, and 
here's a picture with um, a lot of different examples of human viral infections. So rhinovirus uh, is one of the causative agents of the common cold. So that's one that we all get. Um, so there's a lot of things like influenza on here, um, herpes, rotavirus, norovirus. Those are all things, measles, rabies. Those are all things that you've probably heard of before. Um, Chicken pox is another one, smallpox. So a lot of those are familiar. Some of these are less familiar, um, but we all kind of have this awareness of viruses. A lot of people get them confused with bacteria. Viruses are non-living. Viruses are much smaller than bacteria, which is living. Um, and there's completely different medication that's used to treat them. So a lot of people will get a common cold, uh, get the flu, ask their friends for antibiotics, which are used to treat bacteria, take them, and that contributes to something called antibiotic resistance, which is what we want to avoid. Um, so the treatment is, should be very specific for viruses. Um, so before we get to that point, a couple of ways that we can avoid getting viruses completely are through basic hygiene protocols like hand washing, but also preventative measures like vaccines. So the first kind of, or like one of the earliest forms of vaccination uh, was taking smallpox scabs and inhaling them. So just sniffing them up your nose or creating a scratch on your skin and rubbing the pus and the scab onto your skin. So this was called variolation. And basically what it was, was kind of like a training session for your immune system. You get exposed to a controlled amount of this contagious uh, infectious substance, your body mounts an immune response, and then when you come into contact with it in a different setting, you're protected against it. Um, and so smallpox is very deadly, there's 50% mortality, and with variolation, only 1% of people who came into contact with smallpox died. So variolation, even before it was a controlled like vaccination effort, was very effective and kind of operates with the same mechanism. So what a vaccine actually is, is a suspension of what we call attenuated organisms. And by attenuated, we mean that they're weakened or killed in some way, so they are not able to cause disease. Um, but they still trigger our immune system in a way that is similar to how the actual uh, pathogenic organism or virus triggers a response. Um, we can also make vaccines with just like small fractions of the uh, of the Thing. I don't want to say organism because uh, viruses are not organisms of the pathogen, so small fractions of the pathogen or even just components of their toxins, um, so it induces an immune response. And vaccines are really important because we, even though we may wash our hands, might avoid people who we think are sick, um, might have medication, uh, it's not foolproof. So vaccines are a evidence-based way to decrease death. They save lives and they're super important. Um, I know that a lot of people have concerns about vaccines, which is valid, um, and there are people who can't get vaccines. So certain types of vaccines can't be taken if you're pregnant or very young or immunocompromised um, or you know, a lot of different situations. Um, but at the same time, uh, a lot of the risks are very overblown. So it's kind of this issue where, you know, we're on the internet now, we see like these extraordinarily rare cases of bad reactions, and we emphasize those more. And a lot of us have lost our cultural awareness of things like mumps and measles and how awful they can be. Um, and so some of those diseases can even wipe out your immunity for other diseases, so then they leave you completely vulnerable. Um, so I would recommend if you have any concerns about vaccines, talking to me. It's totally normal to you know not be sure about it, but please talk to me about it. Or uh, I posted a common misconceptions about vaccines resource to Canvas uh, with some information that is worth looking up if you are not too sure about them. So uh, even though you uh, might not want to get vaccines, you could. A lot of people kind of have this thought where they're like, okay, well, other people are getting vaccines, um, so I don't really need to. But if a lot of people don't get vaccines and have that mentality, then we don't have enough of a threshold for what's called herd immunity. So anyone who can get a vaccine should in order for us to maintain herd immunity and not risk the safety of people like 
babies and people with cancer and the elderly. Okay, so um, going back to specifically viruses, um, I wanted to talk briefly about human immunodeficiency virus, which is HIV. Um, if you have a high enough viral load and you develop a specific set of symptoms, that's called acquired immunodeficiency syndrome or AIDS. So a lot of people see HIV AIDS put together. HIV is the virus that causes AIDS, and we say that it's a retrovirus. I'll explain that in just a moment. Um, but another thing to note is that the reason it's called immunodeficiency is because it binds to immune cells, T cells, um, and eventually causes them to lice. So it destroys our immune system, causing us to become immunodeficient. So we say that it's a retrovirus. Um, I mentioned DNA and RNA earlier. So we have DNA in our cells and the HIV is attacking us. That DNA codes for RNA through a process called transcription, which then codes for proteins through a process called translation. But the HIV virus um, encodes its information as RNA. So to sneak into our genetic information, it has to go through reverse transcription using an enzyme called reverse transcriptase. So I think I've told you guys before, when a word ends in A-S-E, it's an enzyme, and the words in front of it tell you what it does. So reverse transcriptase is an enzyme that helps the virus go through reverse transcription. So it goes from R or it uses the RNA to code for DNA, and that DNA gets snuck into our genetic information and we help make the virus. Um, so in the US right now, there are over a million people living with HIV infections and about 78 million people living with HIV infections worldwide. Uh, so it's a very common um, cause of disease in much of the world. And there's a lot of misconceptions about it. So that being said, um, since the uh, kind of peak of the HIV epidemic, um, deaths from HIV and AIDS have dropped dramatically since we started using what's called antiretroviral therapy and highly active antiretroviral therapy. Um, so we have specific medication now that's used to treat HIV infections and also drug cocktails that are used to address different points of the HIV life cycle. One thing that you should note on this though is that that line for uh, deaths in the thousands due to um, any kind of death associated with AIDS is much higher than HIV specifically. The reason for that is that when you have uh, your immune system compromised through HIV, specifically when you get to the condition of having AIDS, um, you're much more susceptible to infection from other organisms that's called opportunistic infections. Um, and it can be much more serious than getting some of these infections with a healthy immune system. So stuff that would normally kill you, like a yeast infection, can be very dangerous if you have AIDS. Another thing that's kind of sad to note about this um, is so like if you imagine being a person with HIV um, at, in the early 90s and let's say that you have tons of friends in your community who are also you know dying from HIV and AIDS uh, no one really understands it people who have HIV and AIDS are kind of shunned and um, you know discriminated against and people just leave them very lonely in their times of crisis it's a very dangerous and sad time for a lot of people. Um, so people who had HIV would sometimes make decisions that weren't necessarily healthy, maybe be in unhealthy partnerships, maybe blow up their credit because they thought, you know, I'm gonna die anyway. And so then we got to this point where death started dropping. So they put them, you know, they got into these situations um, where they were in really dire mental health states, making different decisions than they normally would um, if they knew that they had hope um, and suddenly they were alive to deal with the consequences. Um, so I think one thing for a lot of you going into medicine to consider is kind of, you know, how when you change patient outcomes, um, kind of caring for them through that transition, keeping especially your patients who are dealing with chronic um, infections and chronic conditions, keeping uh, in touch with their mental health as well, um, because some of these kind of longer term conditions 
can uh, lead to a lot of different outcomes, especially as we change our clinical approaches. So when we think about HIV infections developing, um, this image is pretty cool. It shows a bunch of HIV particles in blue and then a huge CD4 cell in yellow, just so you can kind of see the visually the difference in size between viral particles and cells. Just imagine that cell extends like way beyond the border of your screen. It's just a very tiny fraction of the surface of the cell. Um, so those individual viruses are called particles. They're not actually cells, remember. Um, and when an individual has 10,000 to 15,000 HIV particles inside of their body, that's when we say that it's an infection. Um, so your viral load has to be to a certain point in order to be considered uh, infected with HIV. There's a lot of people now who with uh, very effective um, treatments might have a viral load that's much lower than that or almost undetectable. We still don't really say that they're cured though because it could just mean that we can't detect them with our tools, um, but that's kind of roughly the threshold. And those particles can be free floating, they could be in our immune cells. Um, but one thing to keep in mind is that in every milliliter of bodily fluid from someone who has a progressed HIV infection, there may be anywhere from 100 to 10,000 viral particles. Um, and so a common way that HIV is contracted is through um, sexual fluids. And so uh, the average ejaculate is about four milliliters. That's 40,000 viral particles in an advanced case being transmitted. So that's why uh, protected sex is very important and we'll talk about a couple of different ways of protecting ourselves. Um, another thing that you can have is multiple strains. So you might have several different strains of HIV, um, in which case you might need to take multiple different types of medication depending on uh, what specific strain mutation you have. So a lot of people, when they think about HIV, think about sexual transmission, um, and it is the uh, way in which most HIV infections are transmitted, but a lot of people have misconceptions about it. So in the mid 80s, uh, less than 2% of HIV cases were transmitted um, between people who identify as male and female, so heterosexual transmission. But as of 2016, heterosexual transmission is the main mode of transmission. Um, of HIV infections. So a lot of people still kind of have this misconception that gay men are most likely to get HIV and that's just not the case anymore. You know, it, um, initially there, uh, I, I can show you guys maps of kind of the spread of HIV. I didn't include one in this set of slides, um, but you know, depending on who you have access to as partners and who you're most likely to come into contact with, um, and depending on how HIV spreads, it might be more likely to be in within a single community. Um, but then as it spreads over time, you know, the fact that it started out in that community doesn't mean that it's always going to be restricted to that community. So that leads to a lot of, you know, misinformation about how to protect ourselves. It leads to a lot of discriminatory policies against gay men, um, specifically in terms of blood donation. And so now it's just like really crucial for everyone to remember that anyone can get HIV. Another thing to remember is that having other sexually transmitted infections can make you more prone to HIV infection because it can lead to lesions and more openings, more portals of entry for HIV. Um, but there's a couple of different ways to protect yourself. Uh, one is through condom use, which you know not everyone likes to use. Um, and especially if you're engaging in sexual activity that's not likely to lead to pregnancy, you might not think it's useful to use a condom, um, but it's still very helpful to protect yourself. And then another thing you might have heard of is PrEP, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis. If you are considered high risk and maybe you're more likely to contract HIV, this is a good daily medication to take to stop the infection from taking place at all. Um, one important medication that's used in antiretroviral therapy is reverse transcriptase inhibitor. So think back to the life cycle. Remember that reverse transcription being a retrovirus using reverse transcriptase is a key component of HIV life cycle progression. Um, and so a medication called a reverse transcriptase inhibitor would stop that viral life cycle.
That being said, there are a lot of non-sexual fluids in our bodies, and so the second most common mode of transmission for HIV is blood, specifically in the form of sharing needles. Um, so that's another problematic one because uh, a lot of people have a tendency to shame people who use injection or in injected drugs. Um, I think there's a lot of misconceptions about the biology of addiction and specifically, you know, how different socioeconomic conditions, different states of trauma, um, our mental health leads to cycles of addiction. Um, and so I think we do people a disservice in this country by limiting their access to mental health resources, um, kind of getting into those habits of self-medication, because uh, no one who injects themselves with fentanyl uh, is trying to have a good time. You know, we're people who engage in sort of those sorts of behaviors, it's because you're trying to heal, you're dealing with pain, um, whether it's mental or physical. And so by depriving people of clean needles, by shutting down needle exchanges, um, by shaming uh, people who use those medications, um, it kind of leads to this unhealthy habit of using dirty needles, of sharing them, of transmitting HIV. Um, and I say dirty there in the context of they have been used before, not that people with HIV are dirty. Um, another common form of transmission uh, is prenatal infection, so from a parent to a child. Um, that being said, if you are carrying a child and you take the correct set of medication, your risk of passing it down to your child drops to 1%. So this doesn't have to be a common mode of transmission. Um, and Blood transfusions used to be another way in which HIV was spread, but now all blood is screened using HIV antibody and HIV RNA tests. So there's only a one in 1.5 million chance of getting HIV from a blood transfusion. Um, it really doesn't happen anymore. Um, the only time it might happen is if someone donates blood before they know they have HIV or bef uh, when the viral load is super low. Um, or in a window where it can't be screened properly, but there's still a lot of policies in place in which people can't donate blood if they are men who have sex with other men. So that doesn't reflect our current knowledge, our, the current science about HIV, it's just discriminatory policies um, and homophobic policies that are still in place from the 1980s. So I mentioned that sometimes HIV infections aren't caught um, or maybe uh, emerge at different rates depending on medication. Um, so when we're thinking about the progression of an HIV infection, uh, before the HIV infection, we kind of measure our CD4 levels. So there's a couple ways to go about measuring this. We could measure the cells that HIV infects, which should be high in concentration in our blood before the infection, or we can measure the HIV itself, so the viral load. Um, so before the infection, we should have a lot of CD4 cells, no HIV particles. After the infection, we have what's called an acute HIV infection, which kind of looks like the flu. Um, and so our numbers of CD4 might start to drop and HIV increases. Um, and so that's an acute kind of intense sudden infection. But then when we get into chronic HIV infection throughout the blood, um, CD4 is slowly decreasing over time and HIV is slowly increasing. So that period of latent infection or chronic HIV infection can last anywhere from 2 to 12 years before it progresses to AIDS without the intervention of ART or HAART. So when we're thinking about what it means to be HIV positive, all that means is that you took an HIV test and it has a positive result. It doesn't say anything about your viral load. It doesn't say anything about your symptoms um, or how it's being managed. Um, and it doesn't even really tell you if you actually do have HIV. So there's a couple of different times in which you might have HIV, but it might not be picked up on the test um, due to different time windows. You can also get false positives where the test tells you that you have HIV, but it's just a mistake from the test. So getting a te positive test result just means you need to you know, be a little bit more cautious and keep looking into things. Um, there's a couple different ways to screen for HIV. One is an HIV antibody test, 
In the next lecture, we'll talk about antibodies, which are proteins used by the immune system to identify and attack pathogens. And if you have an antibody for HIV, then that's an indication that you are infected with HIV. Um, another way, before I get into what just popped up, is um, an HIV RNA test, which is detecting the nucleic acid information specifically for HIV, which is um, a little bit more sensitive. So everyone should get tested for HIV if they're sexually active um, or if you're coming into contact with different bodily fluids. Uh, it's important for early detection so that you can start managing it and then decision making for people who are positive or negative. So another uh, acellular type of infectious agent are prions, which are proteinaceous infectious particles. The P, R, and O come from protein, and then the I, N comes from uh, infectious. So these are proteins that we don't really understand very well, but they change the shape of other proteins. And remember that a protein's shape is key to its function. So if it's changed even slightly, it can completely screw up the function of the protein. Um, you might have heard of mad cow disease. That's caused by a prion. It's called bovine spongiform encephalitis or encephalopathy. Um, there's also krishvad jakob disease and kuru. Kuru was common in uh, cultures that practice cannibalism. Often by eating the brain is how prions are spread. Um, but there's also genetic prion diseases, like the picture of the two, the siblings that are in the top right. Um, there's something called fatal familial insomnia, where the prions are genetically encoded, um, and it's hereditary. Entire families basically just stop sleeping and die. Um, so prions are crazy. Uh, they are extremely um, hard to get rid of. So when they're identified or when it's uh, obvious that someone has um, died of a prion-associated condition, uh, their body has to be burned, the whole uh, morgue or the whole exam room has to be sterilized in really extreme ways. So these are highly infectious. Okay, so I'm going to do a quick review of prokaryotes before kind of sharing a little bit about how they cause disease. Um, so uh, we're going to briefly talk about the structure of prokaryotes, uh, a few pathogens uh, grouped according to gram staining, um, how we might identify pathogens as causative agents of disease, and then some good bacteria. So remember, um, by prokaryotes, we mean archaea and bacteria. Um, we've talked a little bit about how we group them. When we're thinking about their structures, um, both for archaea and for bacteria, they lack a nucleus, so their DNA is just kind of loosely arranged in their cell. They have a cell wall made of a material called peptidoglycan for bacteria. Peptido should make you think about proteins. Glycan should make you think about sugars. Um, and some of them have extra structures, including structures for motility. I'm going through this fast because these were slides that you've already seen before from week two. Um, and when we say prokaryotes, we usually mean bacteria, especially when we're talking about what are pathogens, because we don't know of any archaea that cause disease. So archaea are part of our microbiome, they're part of our good bacteria living in our body, um, but we don't know any that cause disease. Okay, so some terms that you're probably going to hear a lot throughout um, your biology education, especially if you go into nursing, are going to be gram-positive and gram-negative. This is based on a staining practice that uses a dye called Gram's iodine. Um, and basically, you go through a series of dyes, kind of rinsing bacteria with these dyes and taking off color. And the way that the color ultimately ends up sticking to the bacteria depends on the structure of their wall and membranes. Um, so it's a quick way to kind of group bacteria, whether they're gram positive and purple or gram negative and pink after the staining procedure. So gram positive cells um, have a cell membrane like every cell and they have a very thick cell wall. Gram negative cells have their normal membrane, a very thin peptidoglycan cell wall, and then another membrane that has lipopolysaccharides or LPS. Um, so we see for gram positive, one membrane, thick wall, gram negative, two membranes, thin wall. So again, it's just kind of a quick and easy way to identify bacteria or at least start to identify them. 
Um, the goal of that is so that we can start identifying what medication to take because you should only use medication that's targeted for the infection that you have. Um, and so uh, with gram positive, those might be things like clostridium, which causes botulism and tetanus, as well as C. diff, which is um, really common if you've taken antibiotics and killed your good gut microbes. Uh, C. diff is common in a lot of clinical settings. Um, Staphylococcus causes MRSA, which you might have heard of, and I'm sure all of you have heard of strep throat that's caused by streptococcus. All of those are gram positive. For gram negative, these are a lot of things that live kind of deeper in your tissue and anaerobic conditions. Um, so E. coli causes food poisoning, urinary tract infections, different things like that. Whenever you get piercings, you have to sign a waiver about Pseudomonas aeruginosa because uh, it can commonly affect, infect piercings um, and is very antibiotic resistant. And then the cause of the plague, Yersinia pestis, is also gram negative. Not that the plague is common anymore, but it's something that you probably have heard of, though it does still happen. Um, there's some bacteria that don't fit nicely into gram staining, so we have to use what's called acid fast staining to identify mycobacterium. Um, these are really unique bacteria that uh, have this like kind of waxy substance um, on their surface. Um, so they have these mycolic acids that stop them from gram staining. Um, and so the causative agents of leprosy and tuberculosis are actually mycobacteria. So when we think about what is causing a disease, one of the first kind of uh, clinical um, evidence-based ways uh, we use to identify what is causing a disease is something called Cox postulates, or sorry, Cox postulates. Um, and so these help clarify, you know, what is causing the disease um, and point to specific microbes um, as the causative agent. So here with Cox postulates, we see that um, you have to have a healthy organism and a diseased organism. Basically, um, the bacteria or the microbe that you think is causing the disease has to be found in the diseased organism, but not the healthy organism. You have to be able to isolate it and culture it, inject it into a healthy organism, and then have the same disease manifest and then isolate it again. So it's a series of kind of identifying, isolating, causing the disease again, identifying, isolating, to prove kind of um, with evidence that this is what's causing the disease. But it's kind of tricky because there's some bacteria that can't be cultured in a lab. Um, there's some things like HIV that only infect humans, so we can't really go through that process of isolating and infecting again. Um, some bacteria cause many symptoms. Some symptoms are caused by many different bacteria. So it's a little bit trickier than just following Koch's postulates to identify disease. There's also some pathogens that are very picky in how they grow. So again, some can't be cultured in the lab. Um, we actually grow the causative agent of leprosy on armadillos. That's the only way that we can grow it. Um, chlamydia has to be grown using cell culture because uh, it grows inside of cells. Um, and some bacteria need super low oxygen, high CO2 conditions like you would find in the gut or the lung. So they have to be grown in special chambers. So the human microbiome um, is something that we're beginning to really appreciate as being really important for uh, health, health outcomes. Um, so we have this community of normal flora, kind of these um, creatures that grow inside of our body, basically on every cell surface. Um, we actually have more bacterial cells in our body than we have our own cells, but because they're so tiny, um, we don't look like bacteria. And it's so cool because different parts of our body, depending on how dry or salty it is, has completely different communities of microbes. So we're basically walking planets for these organisms, which is just wild to me. And depending on um, different disease states, so like someone with inflammatory bowel disease or type 2 diabetes uh, might have completely different microbial communities in their gut or in other locations. So this microbiome influences our health, it influences diseases or diseases influence it, um, it helps make vitamins and help with digestion, and it also kind of prevents uh, colonizing bacteria that might be pathogenic from coming in and growing in our body. So if we take medication that kills our normal flora, our human microbiome, bad guys, bad pathogens can come in and grow and cause disease.
So that's what happens with Clostridium difficile or C. diff like I mentioned earlier. So again, our gut community is very important. Um, and actually a fun fact is that about 40% of your fecal mass is just bacteria coming out of your gut. Um, and it's mostly anaerobic, meaning it doesn't use oxygen. Um, so they kind of hang out and aid in digestion. Okay, so I'm gonna briefly review protists. We did kind of talk about them. Uh, I think I mentioned them briefly in week two, but we didn't go in depth. Um, so if we're looking at this tree of life, what protists actually are, um, are these unicellular eukaryotes. They are eukaryotes like our cells that are single celled. Um, so it's tricky because they have a lot of features in common with our cells, like a nucleus that bacteria and viruses don't have. So it's really hard to kind of design drug targets to treat them uh, since they are a lot more similar to us. So in this, uh, in this tree, you can see that protist has two branches. The reason for that is there's two groups of protists. Um, before I get into that, I wanted to kind of uh, clarify some terms that I've been using. So we have prokaryotes, protista or protist, and protozoa. Prokaryotes is completely separate. It's referring to bacteria and archaea, um, which are completely separate domain. Eukaryotes include the kingdom protista, which in, uh, is made up of protists. Some of those are protozoans, which are animal-like, and the rest are algae, which are plant-like. So keep all those pro terms separate in your head. They all mean something completely different. So protists are really hard to define. We don't really understand how they're related to one another. Um, they're really just grouped by being single-celled eukaryotes. Algae are more like plants. Protozoans are more like animals. Um, and when we define them, we usually define them based on how they move around, so their motility in their active state. Um, so here you can see uh, in that orangey picture, you can see cilia moving around. Um, in the blue picture, you can see an amoeba with pseudopods. Um, it's streaming its cytoplasm and its uh, cytoskeleton to basically make feet with its cell membrane and move around. Um, in the bottom right, you see what's called an apical complex. That's not used for movement, but it is used because those are um, all parasitic. So they all have to uh, attach to a host and they do that with the apical complex. So apicomplexins, the organisms that have a apical complex, um, tend to be very medically relevant because they always need a host. So those include things like plasmodium, which causes malaria, trypanosome, which causes African sleeping sickness, and toxoplasma gondii, which is found uh, in cat feces. Um, it, uh, can, it's not really dangerous for humans, um, with the exception of pregnant people, because it can cause death in a fetus. So that's why if you're pregnant, it's really important that you never change cat litter. Um, something that's kind of weird about toxoplasma is it um, makes you like, change your behavior too. So uh, people who are infected with toxoplasma gondii are more likely to take risks, they're more likely to ride motorcycles, they're also more likely to like cats, so then they uh, kind of interact with cats more, get more toxoplasma, it's a weird cycle. Okay, so just briefly talking about fungi um, and how they're medically relevant and some structural ideas about them. Um, so fungi are non-motile, they don't move around, but they are eukaryotes. Um, so again, they're very similar to our cells. Uh, the exception to that is that they have a cell wall. So they have a cell wall made up of a material called chitin, which you can target. Um, but in a lot of ways, they have similar organelles to us, which make them harder to treat than bacteria. So you might have heard of mushrooms, puffballs, molds, and yeast. Those are all different types of fungi. So there's some that are macrofungi. Those are kind of traditionally what you think about when you think about fungi. So these are mushrooms, puffballs, truffles. Um, and the part that you see is actually the fruiting body. So there's a whole network below that you don't get to see. Um, that's why if you've ever seen like a circle of mushrooms or if you have a spot on your lawn where you keep pulling out mushrooms and they keep coming back, that's because there's a whole network of their cells below the surface that you don't see. And so you have no way of getting rid of that. Um, and macrofungi are just 
amazingly beautiful and I just want to take a moment to acknowledge that um, there's some that are bioluminescent some that look like they're bleeding some that look like the gates of hell and they're just crazy beautiful they tend to uh, be poisonous if we eat them um, or have psychoactive effects uh, but they're not necessarily things that are actively infecting us those are other things um, like mold, uh, which are strings of long filamentous cells. The individual filaments are called hyphae, um, and the networks of those hyphae are called mycelium. You don't need to worry about memorizing those terms. Just know that mold is a fungus and that fungi are harder to treat because they're similar to our cells. Same with yeast, which are single-celled fungi. Uh, you might have heard of Saccharomyces cerevisiae, which is baker's yeast, and then Candida albicans is commonly found on the human body. Um, so they're important economically and medically for humans, and they basically look like big bacteria. But they can cause really serious diseases. So when we say mycoses, that means a fungal infection. Um, they can be on your skin. Skin, they can be underneath your skin or they can be throughout your whole body. Um, candidiasis is a very common one. Um, and so when we, again, we we're talking about opportunistic pathogens earlier, usually it doesn't cause disease. Usually having a candida infection doesn't cause disease. Um, but when you have immunocompromisation, like with AIDS, then it can cause death. Okay, so um, I'm gonna post this video tonight. I will probably post the next lecture for the immune system tomorrow as soon as I can. So when that's posted, please make sure you watch it um, and start to integrate ideas uh, between the circulatory system and causative agents of disease and the immune system. Keep building those ideas on one another.